Nora and I have been asked to come along today to give a bit of an overview on the European single procurement document. We've been doing quite a lot of roadshows, workshops similar to this to try and explain a little bit more about what the European single procurement document is and try and answer any questions or concerns that buyers or suppliers might actually have. It's a bit of an introduction because I think the knowledge base in the room is likely be, to be quite diverse. So a reminder about what the ESPD is and its purpose. I cover a little bit of what the ESPD in Scotland is in practice. Try and focus on some of the key challenges. So as we've been doing these kind of workshops, we've been gathering a bit of knowledge and picking up on what the key issues and key concerns are. So we thought that might be useful to explain some of those key issues and talk a little bit about what's next, and if we do have time, to cover some questions and answers. Okay, so first of all then, a bit of an introduction and a reminder about the ESPD. Of course, the ESPD is new, um, and I think that's one of the key challenges. Anything that's new is quite different, and it is quite a difference to the approach that we took previously with the standard pre-qualification questionnaire. It's been in place since April 2016, so that's nearly a year and a half. But some of you, as a buyer or as a supplier, may be using the ESPD even now for the first time. So although it's been around for a while, it could still be new to you. In Scotland, um, we've been recognised as an early adopter of the ESPD when it was first introduced. Um, we were one of the first countries to actually introduce some supporting guidance. We felt that was really important because without some form of guidance, we couldn't really encourage a consistency of approach. The ESPD is mandatory for all OJU threshold value contracts and for lower value contracts, which we've regulated in Scotland. So that's for 50,000 and above for goods and services and 2 million for works contracts we also encourage the ESPD use as well to ensure consistency. So really the first thing to point out is consistency. I've mentioned it a couple of times already, but that's the fundamental premise of introducing the ESPD. It's a consistent format across all member states in Europe. So it's the same regulations that have introduced the ESPD that set out the format, the language, the remit for it, the idea there is, as a bidder, if you're bidding across any country in Europe, you will see the same form and format when actually looking to apply for a procurement process. The other key change to talk about is self-declaration. Now, the emphasis here is to simplify things for suppliers. Now, we hear quite a lot from the buyer community that it doesn't necessarily simplify things for them. And that's because really what we're looking for is the form to be completed with all the requirements that are necessary for selection and for the bidder to simply complete it with their declaration that they meet all the selection requirements, i.e. the evidence about meeting the selection requirements is only then necessary from the winner. So as a bidder, simple format producer certificates and evidence only if you're going to be winning the contract. So with that in mind then, the ESPD is designed as a reusable form. We often try and describe it as a bit like your CV. So as a supplier, you're able to set out your personal details as an organisation, where you do or don't comply with exclusion grounds, and it'll be your place to describe the skills and qualifications that exist inside your organisation. So something that you should be able to reuse for future bids. The ESPD also supports the drive generally towards e-procurement. And of course, ESPD has been integrated into PCS tender, and it's also a part of the PCS system as well. And we're already working on how we can continue to improve the ESPD in both of these systems. Useful also to clarify that the ESPD is focusing simply on selection. There's nothing in the ESPD process that is thinking about the contract itself, 
So it's nothing to do with the invitation to tender or the award criteria. It's simply looking at you as an organisation and you as a bidder. So essentially what the ASPD is looking for is your response to what will be criteria to determine whether you as an organisation are capable of delivering this contract. So it focuses on two key elements, exclusion grounds. So these are the criminal convictions that are required in the regulations that we determine whether bidders fall foul of any of those grounds. So that's any criminal convictions, any social labour environment laws that you might have fallen foul of. However, the good side to all of that is even if you do have a conviction or you maybe have fallen foul of any of your obligations, we want you to tell us what you've done to put your house in order. What remedial action have you taken that might reassure us, despite there being a ground, that you've actually done sufficient measures in order that you could be reliable to still perform this contract? So don't be put off if that's the first hurdle that's a challenge. The second element of the ASPD is focusing on selection elements. So this will be asking about things like your financial standing, the levels of insurance that you have as an organisation, the experience that you have in your organisation to deliver this type of contract, maybe the skills of your staff, <coughs> etc. All of these requirements, though, must be related to the contract and they must be very, very clear and transparent to you about how the buying organisation will actually measure and determine whether you do or don't meet those selection requirements. So just a reminder, it's not about the elements to do with the award of the contract, and it's not to do with the ITT. So let's see how this works in practice. Susan already mentioned that the ESPD replaces the SPQQ. There are two places where the buyer can get the same version of the ESPD. One of them is an electronic version on PCS standard, and the other one is on the procurement journey. These are always the same version and the most up-to-date versions. Um, the main rule is that the buyer cannot come up with their own questions, or they cannot modify the ESPD questions. So the buyer can only choose those questions, what is required for the procurement process, and keep those in the document. They can only delete what they don't need. We have also developed the standardized statements for the buyers. So the buyer needs to put these statements in the contract notice, which, which need to closely relate to the ESPD questions. And these have only been developed in Scotland to help standardize the whole process. Public buyers are not required to stick to these statements, so they can modify the statements or come up with their own. I will show you now the best practice support what we develop for buyers. Um, although these guidance have been developed for buyers, it might be really useful for suppliers to use this too, because these are available for all and aim to develop consistency of the approach. And the format of these templates will be always the same, even if the public body uses different questions or different standardized statements. One of these stations is the ESPD station in the procurement journey. I don't know how many of you have seen the procurement journey before. It can be found in Route 2 and Route 3, and I also circled in here in the map. So this is the station which deals with the ESPD and contains all the information. And as I already said, it might be useful for suppliers to have a look to understand where the buyer is coming from or what kind of questions the buyer is required to use or what kind of statements. And also, this is the sh station which holds the most up-to-date version of the ESPD. And again, it might be useful for the supplier to, to have a look on the whole ESPD document, because buyers might delete some guidance before publishing the document. So it can be that some of the suppliers haven't even seen some of those guidance what we put, put in this document. Um, also, if the buyer uses PCST, then PCST has different kind of ESPD guidance, and because of system restrictions, usually less guidance. So we would highly advise to have a look on the station and those on the ESPD document. But bear in mind that all contracts will be different, and the approach might differ. So it's totally up to the public body what kind of questions to use. So you can't expect that the public bodies will always use the same statements or the same questions, because it's procurement specific. 
The other station, what you might find useful, especially if you are a buyer here now, is the contract notice and advertising station. It comes to stations after the ESPD station. And this is the station which deals with the contract notice. So you can find all the information about the contract notice, including character limits and what kind of statements to use and where to put them on this station. Again, this might be quite useful for suppliers to see where buyers are putting the information. So for example, two pieces what I would like to highlight is 2.2.9 of the contract notice where buyers are required to put the selection criteria. So if you are a supplier and you get a contract notice, then for example, this is the section where you will find all the selection criteria, the statements, the weighting, and the scoring. I also would like to highlight um, 3.1.1 of the contract notice where the selection statements start. So this is the place in the contract notice where the buyers are required to put the selection statements which closely relate to the ESPD questions. So if you're a supplier, then you know that all the ESPD related question statements will be under 3.1.1. Let's see some of the ESPD challenges. We asked around and we got in touch with the Supplier Development Programme to try and identify, try and anticipate what the questions are that you would ask of us. And these genuinely are the most common areas that we get asked about when it comes to the ESPD. So um, if you don't mind, we'll just assume that this might be helpful for you, but please do ask other questions. So the first point is use the contract notice. The ESPD has brought about the most significant change to the way we use the contract notice. So the contract notice is the advert, it sets out what the contract is all about, but now what it also contains is the really critical information about selection. So the things that we're going to ask you to describe in the ESPD form. We've got a slide which will show you exactly where in the contract notice that information is contained, but we can't reiterate enough the importance of one, buyers being clear in the contract notice what those requirements are, and if you're a supplier looking to bid for a contract, please do look at the detail in the contract notice because it will describe things like the type of experience that the buying organisation is looking for you to describe in forming a judgment about whether you're capable to submit an ESPD in this case. The next element that's really important to highlight is in relation to part two of the ESPD form, which is all about information concerning the bidder. So this is if you're a supplier, this is all about you. So the first area of concern is with regards to a section called form of participation. So this is where if you are looking to join together with other organisations and form either <coughs> a consortia or a partnership or whatever type of relationship it is, is to describe that in this part of the ESPD. The reason we're asking for that information is to know who the contracting party is that we will actually contract with if you're successful in winning the contract. Now, where that starts to get confusing is in relation to item number three we've listed here, which is the SPD also allows you to rely on the capacities of other entities. So if when you look at the contract notice, and you look at all those selection requirements and you think, damn, I don't quite meet all those requirements that are expected of me. <coughs> don't worry, you could join forces with another organisation who can fill the gaps that you don't meet, and together you can submit a bid. So that's where you're relying on the capacities of another organisation, no matter the relationship you have, in order that together you can meet all of the selection requirements. So that's quite different to item two here, the form of participation, because the relationship might be quite different to how you would legally contract with the buying organisation. Item four, the SPD also asks for information about subcontractors. We're really keen to encourage subcontractors as much as possible in all public contracts. And the SPD asks a number of questions. Some are very simple and some will be more detailed. The starting point is we're just asking, do you intend to subcontract? useful information for us to understand what supply chain might look like. The SPD also asks, 
If you know the name of any of your subcontractors, please let us know who they are. Now, there will be a large number of instances where, as a bidding supplier, you won't know yet who your whole supply chain is. That's understood and that's accepted. So we're only asking for details of subcontractors you know at that time. Now, the second aspect of subcontractors is recognising that the ASPD can be used for another purpose, particularly in relation to exclusion grounds, because the new regulations when they came in a year and a half ago allowed us to apply the exclusion grounds down the subcontracting chain. So a buying organisation may choose to ask the main contractor to get an ESPD from all the subcontractors. This is simply for the purpose of verifying whether there are any exclusion grounds present in the subcontracting chain. The form has caused some confusion and we've had ESPDs coming in from all subcontractors and filling out all parts of the form. So it's really just to clarify, it's simply about exclusion grounds and only where the public body, the buying organisation, have asked for verification of whether they exist or not. Item five in this list then is to do with part three of the SPD, which picks up on those exclusion grounds. Generally straightforward. The only area that tends to cause a bit of confusion <coughs> is with regards to social, environmental and labour laws. Um, we keep being asked, what are they? Well, it'd be a very, very long list. I think it's an infinite list of what those laws we'd all refer to. So as a bidder, we'd only suggest, please, you must be as open and honest about where you feel you haven't met your obligations under these categories of social, environmental and labour law. But recognise what I was saying earlier. Even if you have fallen foul of any of your obligations, we want you to tell us what you've done to put your house in order and what remedial action you've taken. And the regulations require the buying organisations to take that into account and form a judgement about reliability to perform the contract. And the last point is simply with regards to seeking further evidence. Mentioned already, we would only expect to see evidence about meeting selection requirements from the winning bidder. However, a buying organisation can, if they think there's a risk to the procurement of the, the conduct sorry, of the process, ask for that evidence early. That wouldn't happen in all instances, only when it's regarded as being necessary to safeguard the process. I'm conscious of time, um, so if it's okay with you, what I'll just show you is one more slide with regards to where to look in the contract notice for this important information. There's information about this on the procurement journey that Nora was referring to, but the really important parts of the contract notice are sections 2.2.9 and section 3. That's where that specific criteria will be listed in the contract notice. There's examples of these contract notice in the procurement journey, so hopefully that would help to make you more familiar. Do we have time for any questions? Where is the line between the reliance on capacities and subcontractors? So if you're a main contractor and you rely on electrical or mechanical contractors, where is that line? I think this is a great question because it's this word relying on that creates quite a lot of confusion. So yes, there's every likelihood that a main contractor will rely on a subcontractor to deliver part of the contract. That is quite different to relying on that organisation to meet some of those selection requirements that were in the contract notice. Okay, so that's the difference. So you either would rely on them to deliver the contract or rely on them to meet those selection requirements of contract notice. That's the difference. Okay. Yes, you mentioned right at the beginning that this is a set forum and it can't be altered or changed, but if there is feedback to say there are some problems and issues, what is the mechanism for feeding back that you want to make changes or adaptations, surely it will be reviewed and revised as time goes on? More than welcome to hear your views on how it's working in practice and I would say log those queries with the Scottish Procurement mailbox. 
we can probably anticipate what might be being said, and we've already represented our views, which we've been hearing at workshops about the complexity of the form and format, and are working on making some modifications. The key concern that we keep hearing about is that the contract notice and the ESPD are separate forms. Wouldn't it be easier if they were brought together? So we're looking at how we can do that and in a legal and compliant way that still makes consistency with the rest of Europe. Thank you guys, thank you very much.